Welcome to Automotive EV. My name is Peter Wooding and thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to focus on episode three of our Automotive Outbound series. Um, the episode um, is actually focusing on acceleration of judicialization. That's a difficult word to say sometimes. And, uh, but sort of before I hand over to um, Ben, John and her, I, uh, I, I just wanted to say a, a few words um, regarding the uh, sad loss we, we heard over a, a number of days ago. Um, unfortunately and sadly, Dominic Ticklecamp passed away um, very, very recently. And um, it is going to make, it's going to be an impact on, on the industry because the guy was not just experienced, he was not just a professional, he was a real gentleman. And he, he looked to driving everything forward, um, the same as, as, as you guys do. So um, sorry for the sad news if, if anyone hadn't heard, um, but um, we are going to miss him. And um, he would want us to be carrying on. He should have been on this session uh, and he was supporting the, the entire series. So um, sort of uh, God bless the Dominic. Um, so, what I'd like to do now is I will hand you over to Ben, who is going to steer and moderate the session, and um, let's enjoy the session, and it's over to you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that introduction and for the, for the appropriate words uh, regards Dominic. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this session. Um, we are, I'm sure, all in different phases of lockdown in different places and have had, uh, all have similar stories to tell over the last 12 months. But it's clear that the last 12 months have accelerated a lot of adaptation and change by necessity. You know, uh, everyone's had to adapt to working differently. Um, the automotive industry, amongst all others, uh, dealers, logistics providers, manufacturers, and customers, of course, as well. Um, it's one of the things that's really impressed me is the ability of, of and the willingness over the last 12 months of um, supply chain partners to collaborate and work together. Uh, we've seen some fantastic supportive actions uh, from OEMs and from others uh, and ways of collaborating, which in previous times was thought too difficult. And so what was thought too difficult has shown, turned out not to be quite so in the face of absolute necessity. So um, what we'd like to discuss in this session is digitization uh, and in particular how the last year has, has informed how that might how might that might follow on from the pandemic and the post-pandemic recoveries across, to, across Europe. Um, we're going to have a free and open discussion uh, and I'm going to uh, the three of us will have a have a discussion around some of the key topics, but we're very open, obviously, to questions coming in. So please do put them in to Peter either through a chat or, um, uh, yeah, just just make yourself uh, heard, whichever way is appropriate. So please do ask questions. Um, so first, I'd like to introduce um, our colleagues, uh, John Cooper, um, previously CEO of Venturus. I'm sure. Uh, many of you are well aware of him and his long uh, history in the in the sector. And secondly, um, Herb Moulin um, uh, of Renault, uh, Nissan of Alliance Logistics, um, who has also been very active in the ECG digitization working group. So um, a lot of experience here. Uh, myself, if you if, if you don't know me, uh, I've worked with ICDP for over 20 years now in various roles on and off, either as an employee or as a as a consultant um, and I'm associate director for them now so uh, without further ado uh, I'd like to kick off with one of the, the areas we want to discuss so we've seen a, 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 a quite a rapid emergence of online selling um, again by necessity from from many dealer groups and OEMs at the at the national market level um, a combination of that plus telephone sales and, and, and more traditional means of communication remotely um, and alongside that contactless delivery 
And quite a few in the sector, particularly at the retail end, have been wondering, well, how this will change things in the future. Um, so will the emergence of, of online and remote selling in new car sales impact upon finished vehicle logistics in any substantive way going forward? Um, I mean, I've got my own views on that. I mean, I, uh, certainly the fleet sector, that's quite mature in terms of contactless sales, um, particularly have user choosers uh, selecting off a list, and then the delivery is often made to a place of work or home with a handover done that way. And PDI might even be done at a central compound rather than at a dealer's location. Uh, but in the retail side, it's fairly uh, immature. Um, although, as I said, this last year has seen quite a lot of change by some dealers. Not all have done it. Some have embraced it and, and done very well. Um, and the, certainly the lessons I've been hearing, particularly from NSCs, but also dealer groups, is the, is the different skill set and approach required to final delivery. So... Uh, smaller transporters, rather than 11 car transporters, and uh, more training required of the, the driver. They're not simply there to safely load, unload, and uh, handle the vehicles. They're there to act as a representative for the brand, uh, manage the handover of the car, explain the functionality, and so on. So it, it, it's uh, certainly a higher cost service, uh, and though, although it's not obvious whether the dealer will be doing this from their locations, many have been, or whether it comes directly from a compound and more managed by an NSC. So those are my sort of thoughts, but I think I'll speak to my 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 my, my fellow panelists at this point. So uh, perhaps, Hervé, maybe we could hear what you might think about this. Yes, um, as you say, there's uh, something very important in uh, in uh, keeping the contact with the with the customer, and at the same time. Uh, um, uh, serving him through uh, different channels than now. Uh, it's uh, very important for the for the AOEM to be in contact with the with the customer all the way through, and to provide him uh, um, uh, a close service. Uh, and uh, it becomes more difficult when the, when these uh, customers do not go to the uh, to the dealerships anymore or uh, if they want to uh, to go through different channels so there's a real challenge here in fact for us i think and um, uh, in terms of digitalization what i would say is that um, um, for, the, for the moment in terms of vehicle distribution and the digitalization uh, we are um, in a, a world where uh, we operate large amounts of vehicles in a very controlled environment because we we start from the from our big factories we go through our big centers we have lots of people uh, uh, that are specialized in dealing with uh, vehicle distribution and they go always from the factory to the lead to the dealership everything clean and well controlled but uh, in the in the world to come, we see that uh, it's going to be quite different. As you said, we are, we are going to have direct deliveries. We are going we are going to have uh, moves of vehicles uh, um, in uh, through different channels. We may have uh, um, uh, the uh, with uh, uh, we may have uh, vehicle trials without contact. Uh, we may have lots of lots of things like that, new channels to try and experiment uh, to uh, to suit the, the current world, which is full of disruptions. So, uh, in terms of the digitalization, digitalization, if we want if we want to keep these uh, uh, these channels under control, uh, if we don't want to get lost in uh, in all this. We, uh, I think, uh, vehicle, uh, vehicle, connected vehicles have a very important part to play because uh, uh, in the in the maze of uh, different channels that we can have, very individualized channels that we can have, uh, uh, delivering one vehicle after after another, 
uh, not not necessarily in dealerships, but uh, all over the place. If we want to, if we don't want to get drowned in uh, all this, we OEMs, we have to keep a direct link between uh, 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 between our vehicles and ourselves. And uh, since the only permanent uh, permanent uh, thing in all these uh, in all these new channels will be the vehicle itself, then it's important that we we have uh, a connected vehicle that tells us the OEM where the vehicle is and uh, and uh, at which which step of its delivery uh, it uh, it is. If we want to if we want to keep this direct link with the customer and to keep control over the whole channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thanks, uh, Herb. Bed. That's that's very interesting. Absolutely. I mean the. I want to sort of get more into the uh, connectivity issue in a moment and, and channels, but I think, um, I mean, one th one thing that comes up quite often is is a lot of dealers and and others saying, well, customers will just want to go back to the dealership. They they really do, and that they're actually relatively safe environments if they can be controlled That's good in the pandemic and so on. And I, and I think, you know, I don't think it's a binary thing. You know, either it's going to be online or offline. A lot of customers will will use both. There'll be some that prefer online and. And perhaps use apps to to have a subscription on a vehicle, and there are others which are more 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 um, more interested in a traditional purchase. But um, I think uh, the, the, your point about the, the different channels and therefore the managing the complexity of that, I think, is an interesting one. Um, I'll come back to the connectivity in a moment. But if, uh, John, if I can go to you and and see what your thoughts are on online channels and and delivery. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, maybe more from from the perspective of logistic service providers, I think, because uh, this this gradual emerging, uh, let's say, direct sales process uh, is there has been done for some years and will will continue. If you from a digitalization process, I think the current service providers are well equipped to uh, to adapt and to live to deliver that home delivery services that uh, with, di with different trucks within the current, let's say, digital infrastructure. And we talk about connectivity and the change of the necessary change of this legacy infrastructure later. So we see it as a, as a gradual change that will probably be be accelerated a bit in the under the current circumstances because more people have experience with online uh, selling. But all the aspects, as you just mentioned, of the the dealer that needs to uh, or wants to get a hold on its customer and or the OEM that wants to keep a grip on the customer are also very relevant aspects of making this this business model change over time and step by step is, uh, is what I think. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting, John. I mean, one other thing that I noticed, um, and maybe we'll come back to it on the logistics side, but is several of um, specialist software providers for dealers, not the, the um, not for the more typical dealer management systems, but for the point solutions such as uh, sales platforms or CRM systems for dealers have been uh, particularly in the first lockdown in April, um, in the sp last spring, they were offering three months free use of apps that were added as add-on functionality to their websites or, or, or telephone or, or smartphone-based websites to allow transaction capability for, for, for dealer groups. And quite a few dealers took, that up, took them up on that offer, obviously, uh, and quite a few of them have been using it and obviously paying the the, the, the software provider for that service. So I think some of the innovation and sort of the, I mean, it, it was an interesting mix of, of a good gesture from the software providers, but also clearly a good marketing uh, and promotion mm -hmm. method to get their software out in the market as well. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think it's that kind of activity which is allowing people to try things which they wouldn't maybe have felt the need or, the, or didn't, didn't prioritize as important previously. Um, and and I mean, if we hadn't had lockdowns, then may, maybe more dealers wouldn't have tried doing these things. So, um, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and now just broadly, I, I can see a lot of projects have been accelerated at NSC level um, and very much at the dealer group level. Um, and that's not just in the franchise sector as well. You can see it in the used car sector as well. And maybe I'll come back to that later. But things like um, Cluno and Kazoo's acquisition of Cluno and Drover. A sort of used car subscription platforms as well raise some interesting questions for both new and used vehicles and 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 how they may be moved more differently in the, in the future um at this point i think maybe if we move on to connectivity more broadly i think 
Um, I mean, more and more cars are now connected as standard. Um, that's clearly an enabler for the finished vehicle logistics chain and several brands have been using uh, connectivity and telematics in their cars already to track vehicles and monitor things like battery charge. Um, an internet of things, I know that's developing in logistics in general. Um, uh, there's a, a project that's just finishing at the EU level, which has been looking at the physical internet, which is using uh, real-time connectivity data from live trucks, trains, uh, barges, uh, pallets, uh, containers, uh, clearly transporters can be can be applied uh, in the same way to allow a, a more real-time collaborative uh, logistics uh, operation at, at lots of levels, at ports, high-speed corridors, uh, and closer to the customer. But I think there's a wider picture of connectivity, which is the greater granularity of data. I think, I mean, have you just pointed to that? And I think it's, I remember someone talking to me about um, when Tesco first brought their club card, which is their customer loyalty card, out in the 90s and said, well, it gives us all this huge richness of data about customers' purchases at the detailed level, every customer, what they spend, where, when, uh, and we can do amazing things with this for our supply base, for product planning, but also for promotions and so on. But they said at first it was like drinking from a hose pipe. And I think it's one thing to have the data and the connectivity. It's another thing yes. altogether to know what to do with it. Uh, so I wondered if you had any thoughts about how LSPs in particular may be able to better use this data. Um, maybe, John, if I go to you first, and um, particularly thinking about your experience of blockchain and so on. Yeah, yeah of course, having been deeply into digitalization over the past two years, um, uh, Ben, I think well, the, the overriding theme, I think, in digitalization is um, real-time supply chain visibility, yeah, what we've seen over the past year with supply chain stopping and, and going and stopping again and the semiconductor shortage and the container issues. It's absolutely clear that supply chain visibility, which was on the agenda already, is, is on top of the agenda today for ed, for every, not only OEM, but also for, for uh, every LSP. So that's, that's step one. And um, technology-wise, of course, uh, the, the tools to provide that real-time supply chain visibility are there, whether you call it IoT or connected vehicles or any other set of data that is available on the level of the logistic service provider that basically has in, uh, in, in their systems all relevant data, uh, not only where the vehicle is, uh, which data you can also uh, uh, can be provided through connected cars, but also the status of that vehicle from a logistics perspective. When will it arrive? Does it have a damage? Does it need an, an update in software or stuff like that? With all, which all um, define in the end, the end-to-end -end, uh, process time and very black and white, um, the UPS experience, uh, to call it like this, I bought a new vehicle, dealer, where is it? When will I get it? Can I take it with me on holiday? All these aspects are relevant, of course, in this supply chain. So it's not only the, the connected vehicle that provides you the evidence that the vehicle is in the middle between Japan and, and Europe on a ship somewhere on the ocean, but also the related uh, data, the logistics data, when will it arrive? Has it caught a damage? Does it need any, any other EDI or any other, other action that drives the, um, uh, the real-time visibility uh, data that you need to really run the business? Um, so, so that's one. And then, um, of course, based on that visibility, there's also the opportunity to, to collaborate. The, the two big themes in the supply chain world, not only in finished vehicle logistics, but generally speaking, are real-time visibility and, col and collaboration, the ability to collaborate. From a technology perspective, the time is over that two half-empty trucks drive to uh, Land's End in the UK or to any other remote area unloading their cars at the same dealer compound uh, 50 meters uh, away from each other. So that, that time that time's over from a technology perspective and therefore the industry collectively needs to work in, in creating that visibility and also capturing the collaboration benefits, which of course in the Pornwall example are uh, half of the empty miles um, and the, sort of the, um, uh, the, the, the CO2, the sustainability uh, uh, actions that, that uh, are aligned with the, the benefits of, um, of reduction of, uh, of 
yeah. put it as an introduction, Ben, to, uh, yeah, to my no. view on supply chain visibility. Oh, fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to avoid mix, avoiding the deadly B word Brexit today, but um, clearly <laughs> this, <laughs> it's, it's, nothing to do with Brexit. It's, it's, very, it's not, but it, but there are issues about digital tracking, uh, documentation, uh, not necessarily so much for finished vehicles, which have managed the process relatively well over the last few months, but uh, in, in other parts of uh, the vehicle supply chain, it's uh, in parts and, and inbound, it's been more problematic. But, but I, there are issues, I think, about um, long distance flows and particularly, you know, the richness of data that can that can be put together, you know, whether it's vehicle condition, tracking, customer expectations or any services that require, but also the documentation attached to those vehicles as well. Um, uh, on that theme, uh, I've perhaps, Herb, I mean, you've been heavily involved, I know, not just within your group, but also with the ECG digitization working group and uh, yes, yes. perhaps, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure you have a wealth of things to, to say on this. Uh, first, I would uh, like to react on what uh, John said. Uh, to, to say, I totally concur with him when he says that um, uh, vehicle connectivity is just one uh, one piece of the, the whole puzzle. Uh, uh, we, we are perfectly aware that uh, uh, no, not one um, um, Technology only is capable of giving us uh, the whole traceability of, uh, of the vehicles. Uh, we need to rely on the combination of different uh, of different um, um, technologies, such as uh, uh, the GPS of the trucks, of the of the chips. Also, when uh, when the vehicle can't, uh, when the vehicle is uh, is engine off, and uh, uh, some. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, the, um, uh, the RFID can, can also uh, have uh, a part to play. So we need to have uh, um, uh, a combination of different technologies to to uh, provide us with uh, all the um, all the data we need. And uh, as regards the use of this data, as you as you said, Ben, uh, it may be too too many data coming in uh, at the same time, and it's important to know uh, how to use them. Uh, well, uh, I think it's a real challenge for us because uh, uh, in, the, um, in the world of uh, inbound logistics, when we, spot of, when, when we speak of uh, spare parts, of parts and uh, uh, factory, uh, factory logistics, Things are, are, in my opinion, are far more advanced than in finished vehicle logistics. It's, uh, it's, uh, um, they, uh, they have uh, developed uh, standards and um, and um, and tools and uh, and uh, algorithms, etc. Um, far more uh, efficient, I think, than uh, in the finished vehicle logistics sector. Uh, and uh, uh, now that we are going to have uh, uh, a lot of uh, interesting data coming in, then we will be able to do this work in the Finnish logistics sector. But it's, uh, it's um, uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, uh, virgin territory, but uh, because uh, much has been done uh, in, uh, in the past also, but uh, but still, there are lots of things to discover and lots of things to to uh, to improve uh, compared to what has been uh, done in the in the inbound logistics sector. Thank you. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. I mean, on that point, uh, I've just had an interesting uh, question come in on the chat. But before I go to that, um, one of the areas you've been working on the digitization working group is standardization yes. uh, with Odette. I understand, and I, I think that's interesting because obviously that's clearly a barrier. There's no standardization of data of data exchange, but clearly that that allows an easier integration of data feeds, presumably. Yes, this was uh, in fact uh, um, uh, an essential step towards digitalization. We needed to have the uh, digital twin, digital twin of uh, the Finnish vehicle logistics uh, flow, shared by um, all the uh, OEMs and LSPs, and uh, uh, we need to have standards, standard messages 
uh, to uh, cover this whole flow that could be uh, could be adopted by all the um, uh, logistics providers and uh, and the OEMs. And uh, this could not be done before because um, uh, we we lacked um, the, the big organizations and the cooperation of uh, of uh, a large part of the um, of the Finnish vehicle sector to uh, to sit around the table and uh, decide what to do and uh, and agree on what to do. And this uh, and in fact we. We managed to do that by uh, uh, gathering uh, the ECG that uh, who represented the uh, old uh, LSPs, the VDA, uh, all the German manufacturers, and uh, we had uh, other manufacturers too, such as uh, Renault, PSA. I would uh, I would need to say Stellantis now, uh, and. Uh, and uh, all uh, and uh, Volvo and other uh, other manufacturers, we and um, all uh, all the all of them were uh, led by uh, by the expertise of Odette, and we uh, eventually managed uh, to uh, to uh, agree on uh, uh, IT standards and standard messages, both in uh, Edifact and uh, in um, XML. So uh, they can be used widely, and this was published uh, in uh, in May last year. So uh, everybody can uh, can uh, find these standards on the uh, ODET, VDA, or ECG websites, and uh, and start working on them. And we expect many advantages uh, out of these uh, out of these standards because uh, now. Uh, um, especially now that we have uh, uh, the whole industry is in a, in, a, in a difficult financial situation, and uh, we need to adapt quickly to uh, to the, the world to come. We can't spend the time and money on simply on uh, getting harmonized with uh, one another. In, uh, simply in. Uh, Getting, uh, getting compatible with one another, this doesn't bring anything, any added value. So if we can all adopt the standards quickly, we will uh, we will uh, uh, give uh, our uh, uh, we will uh, focus our means on progress instead of just uh, just uh, adaptability. Yes, interesting. Yeah, I mean it removes a fundamental barrier, doesn't it, in terms of time, yes. energy, and cost. So uh... exactly. Yeah, and um, we, we think that uh, if some um, if uh, some major OEMs as uh, as it, it uh, has already begun adopt these uh, these standards, then uh, um, uh, most of the LSPs that are uh, multi OEMs will uh, will be uh, led to adopt them, and in turn this will. Uh, this will bring the the last OEMs who, who were uh, not in the in the move to uh, to adopt these standards uh, in turn. So uh, yeah. it, it could go it could look, go pretty quickly if uh, if the the major OEMs who uh, sign the, the the standards uh, go for go for them quickly. Yeah. Do, have you seen any early signs that the standards have enabled? Or supported more brand collaboration or shared routes. Or uh, we it, know that it... some uh, some uh, OEMs such as um, BMW and Volkswagen and us, of course, we are already working on uh, on them. It's still uh, we still need some time to uh, because uh, we are dealing with uh, big uh, and the old uh, IT systems, mm. so we still need some time to to have it ready. But uh, still, uh, we we hope to see uh, results uh, uh, quickly enough. And um, uh, for our part, for instance, when um, we uh, have already uh, integrated in our plans for, uh, uh, especially for the new um, the new IT messages that were needed, 
such as the messages for the connected vehicles. We integrated it uh, already in our in our standards, so we we will soon see uh, the benefits. Interesting. Thank you. I mean, um, on that theme, uh, I'm wondering to what extent the smaller LSPs may find digitization either a challenge or if there are ways for lower cost solutions for them to to be better integrated i don't i mean there's a range of possible yes. solutions but um i wonder if that's something either um, maybe maybe john if i go to you first and then Herbie, yeah, hold yes. that thought i'll come back to you yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah, i would fully support what uh, hefe was just just saying the, the creating value from digitalization starts with st standardization of data if we all speak the same language obviously we can all work better better together and take out the inefficiencies out of the out of the supply chain and again the, the, the technology is there and there's an enormous amount of value in digitalization we can we we, we didn't we, you, you started to talk about documents and documentation ben of course we haven't even touched on CMRs and damage registrations and all that stuff, which is a huge um, area of um, in inefficiency where still subcontractors are yes. sending paper documents to LSPs that are received after two or three weeks. Um, no time to go into, into that topic, but uh, the value of digitalization is, is massive. It starts with um, standardization, which is the basis for collaboration and for optimization. And also later on, the basis for for uh, automation. And one of the things we've been looking at over the past two years is, of course, uh, touching on the documentation issue with electronic CMR, which is going to come eventually when our German friends finally agree to the to the protocol. Um, but if you have a, a digital electronic CMR message, which is can be trusted for the job done, then you can automate the, the, the payment processes. You don't have to send invoices anymore. You can have automatic payment, etc. And those of us in the in the industry do know how much effort there is on both sides in, in checking invoices and payments and all, all that stuff. So this one example, or the, or the, the levels are so you want is standardization of data, um, collaboration efforts, including the subcontractors. I'll come back on that later if you allow me. And then automation of, automation of processes. And of course, for uh, for subcontractors, there's a significant challenge to, be, to become digital uh, because many of them are um, very small uh, companies uh, working hard with, with basically no no IT systems or let's say Excel, uh, Excel IT systems. So we need to also collectively and um, uh, maybe there's also a role for the ECG to, to play there, collectively to bring them into into a digital world where they can exchange these now standardized or standardized definition of uh, of, of data. And this, this uh, maybe it's a dream, but it's, it has to be a collective exercise of OEMs and LSPs together because everybody has the same interests. And of course, one of the reasons we started uh, Venturas two years ago was, of course, um, if you look um, globally on the, most of the time to the US, there are other companies who are entering this digital space who see the enormous amount of value that is there and who also fairly, it's a competitive world, want to capture that value. So it also needs good strategic thinking from the industry as a whole as to can we collectively define the value which is in digitalization, we can collectively make, a, make an effort to, to grab that value because the everybody knows uh, the, the classical tender processes that we've been having for so many years now, uh, yes, to give you prob probably the best price, but they do not create value. And this is um, black and white for the, for the sake of it. This is, this is old fashioned business. Tendering does not give you any, any value. It, 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 it just destroys value. It marginalizes LSPs. It never gives you the optimization. And let's, let's call it less empty miles. And the Cornwall example is, speaks best potentially. Never gives you the, the real benefits that 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 are are, um, are in reach because the technology is there. Yes, interesting. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the I just kind of take that point back to to have regards the smaller LSPs and um, affordability of of IT integration. Because I, I heard yes, would say something. On, and and we think that uh, this uh, standardization is a real opportunity for the for the small LSPs. In fact. Because uh, 
Um, one of the reasons they, why we could not integrate uh, small LSPs in some of our tenders was that uh, they didn't have the, the resources and uh, to, to get compatible with our IT systems. So if we, if we have a standardized uh, set of messages, then more people can be can be uh, uh, can be uh, competitive and uh, and can uh, join uh, in the tenders. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, uh, it's enough for them to be compatible with one of us, and they get compatible with uh, with uh, everyone. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't require the same uh, amount of uh, of IT uh, and financial resources. Mm -hmm. I mean that that raises another question, which which John just picked up on really I guess which is um, on the tender process I mean we don't want to get too much into that as a, as a particular topic but uh, I think the, the comments that John you just made on the a more dynamic market and real-time data and granularity allows us to respond in a more dynamic way whether that's through contractors and then cascaded down to subcontractors or whether that's a more dynamic market in general um, that raises some interesting questions I think about how particularly capacity can be best utilized and, and, and in collaborative operations um, but you know as circumstances change you know whether it's a, a, a delayed sailing or whether it's a problem at a border or just simple traffic congestion I mean there are, there are lots of situations where plans have to change and remedial action can be quite expensive because things are often in the wrong place when that happens and and you have to reorganize the the logistics and, and I wonder to what extent a more dynamic set of data allows for more dynamic marketplace and the ability to plug in subcontractors to fill gaps as things change. For example, now that was that was a rough, wide ranging question, but I guess what I'm what I'm saying is, is does more dynamic um, data allow for more more dynamic subcontracting and contracting? I think is my question. Uh, maybe John, if I go to you first. Uh, yeah, fine, uh, fine. Ben. Yeah, what what immediately um, springs to mind is now uh, as uh, we back to the the smaller subcontractors who are uh, let's say driving around in Europe, always looking for the next job without having uh, to maintain or the ability to maintain a network. So they're dependent on the larger LSPs or somebody else to give them to give them work. And of course, uh, by not having a collective marketplace uh, when they are empty in Antwerp and they want another another load, maybe now they need to drive to Zeebrugge rather than be able to pick up the other load. It is available, but not visible for them. So let's say conceptually, of course, by digitalization, the ability to create a common marketplace of all, um, of all, all loads in the market that all LSPs slash OEMs have to offer, where everybody's interested in the, the, the lowest number of uh, empty miles. And it touches on you. You started that in your introduction on physical internet in the future, which is conceptually uh, all loads are visible, and uh, and the best carrier can can carry it to the to the next point in the in the in the journey. But that goes a little too far, probably. But one one let's say tangible example would be a common marketplace where this this empty subcontractor standing empty in in Antwerp can find his next load around the corner. Another example, uh, also from, from, from my own experience and discussions, uh, the dealer groups in general terms get bigger, bigger and bigger. And I've had multiple discussions with dealers that saying, okay, yeah, I've got a car or a number of cars coming my way, but I, A, I've got no space because I'm, my, my parking is full, or B, I want a delivery in another location of my dealer, uh, uh, dealer um, uh, locations. Um, but then I need to call the importer and the importer calls the LSP and you know the process. So two examples of how digitalization, real-time visibility and, and, and access to that visibility gives in this example, a dealer the opportunity to manage his own stuff through the system, not through phone calls anymore. Does that answer your question then? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, there's, um, there's some interesting points there about dealer swaps, which can be because, you know, uh, dealers swap cars to sell to customers or, or, within or outside a group across a dealer network um, and some of the NSCs organize this for, for dealers and charge them for the service and some dealers organize it themselves. I mean, I just, just, before, I've just another question come in, but I just want to pick up the question that came in a few moments ago first, which I think 
has a direct relevance to what we're talking about regards uh, a more dynamic uh, and collaborative marketplace, particularly when you get down to small LSPs. So the question that came in from Ian Brown is, the challenge the traditional process would face with more fragmented delivery, i.e. home delivery and different channels like subscription as well as normal leasing and sales, is the same as we see now with, for example, grocery deliverers starting to clog our streets, uh, you know, referring clearly to the huge amount of home delivery for shopping, uh, grocery shopping uh, this last year. How do the panel envisage the developing urban delivery constraints holding back the home delivery progress for new cars? And that's coming from Ian Brown. Thanks, Ian. Um, I mean, my, my, my first thought on that is, I mean, there's, there's again, there's a long-term trend towards innovation in urban logistics, uh, consolidation centers. I mean, there's, there's some famous examples, Heathrow Airport, where everything that's delivered within Heathrow Airport, which in normal times is clearly, which is, we were not in now, but is one of the biggest retail sites in Europe. All the, all the freight has to go through consolidation centers and then delivered to the Heathrow Air, Airport uh, sites. Uh, and there are lots, lots of cities across Europe have experimented with similar ideas. Um, and I mean, we've looked at it in ICDP before, you know, could you have urban consolidation centres outside major cities like London and Paris for finished vehicle logistics, for cross-brand, cross-franchise, for a range of, of dealers within a, a, a greater metropolitan area? And it clearly does offer benefits for making better use of smaller trailers, for getting through delivery constraints and delivery times of day. Um, and presumably, if we are moving to more home delivery, a more consolidated specialist service closer to the customer that dealers can use as well may make a lot of sense in, in urban areas. Um, I don't know um, if that will work in all areas. Uh, but, you know, when you get to more rural locations, the, the logic becomes slightly more difficult to, to, to work through. But I think clearly the cost of, of servicing an urban area and traffic in particular is, is going to be an issue. So um, yes. Uh, uh, John, maybe you want to pick up on that first, and then Hervey, I'll come to you. And, and, and yeah, very briefly. Then I think it will be indeed, as you described already, kind of a, a hybrid of solutions, like for big cities like like Paris or Amsterdam, for that matter. We will have different solutions than the than, than the countryside. It's how do we organise best in relation to 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 costs, uh, to customer expectations, and to environmental. Uh, circumstances. So there's not. I would say there's not one clear answer, and and, and the market and circumstances will define the outcome eventually. Mm -hmm. Herf, um your thoughts? Yes, I'm. Uh, just like you, I'm. Uh, I'm a believer in uh, consolidation centers. I think that uh, that this could, this could uh, really be the solution uh, in the in the future of uh, city, big city deliveries, with uh, instead of uh, multiple. Uh, vans and trucks uh, clogging the, the streets, we, we could have uh, a consolidation center with, uh, with um, uh, uh, a single van uh, containing the, the wares, the, the deliveries for, the, for a single street, all the shops in the street. And, uh, and uh, so uh, you, you, you can optimize uh, through this, you can optimize the the distance, the pollution, and uh, and uh, the clogging of the streets by uh, by delivery vans. Uh, but it's uh, of course it's uh, a bit different for um, uh, finished vehicle logistics because uh, you, your uh, uh, um, uh, a vehicle is quite a bulky thing, and uh, you, if you want to to deliver to deliver it to uh, inside the city, uh, you're bound to have at least. Uh, um, uh, a truck with uh, with some vehicles, uh, some vehicles uh, on it, and uh, of course, if you only deliver uh, two uh, two cars per truck, or if you have individual deliveries, the cost rises up. So uh, it still needs to be uh, to be considered how we we can we can do that. Uh, maybe we could uh, we could do things like this, like some OEMs did in the, in the past with. Um, um, uh, customers coming for uh, 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 to the consolidation center or the factory uh, 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 
themselves for for the for the delivery, and uh, we can offer them a very uh, good experience, even uh, 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 visit of the factory or things like that uh, before they they go with their with their car because uh, the uh, in that case we. Uh, uh, we save time and money in, the, in uh, delivering the car, so we can do more for the customer. Yeah, uh, this was done. Uh, this was this is done, for instance, uh, in uh, our Korean factory at Busan, and uh, it, uh, we know it was done by uh, some German brands also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, we, we will have also. Um, We'll also need to, to rethink the, the delivery of uh, vehicles in big cities uh, with, for instance, um, uh, only showrooms in the cities and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, a service of uh, uh, car deliveries and, uh, and even car uh, um, uh, uh, picking the cars for repair inside the city. Instead of uh, of having uh, 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 whole uh, dealerships in the in big uh, in big cities, where many things can be uh, can be done also. But, uh, yeah, it, it still needs to, to be experimented. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, in addition to the to the questions from Mike Sturgeon and from from Ian Brown, I just wanted to. I'm mean, now come on to the second question that's popped up. Uh, just now in a second but um, I think that that comes on another thing we want to discuss which was we've, we've touched upon already which is the rise of more innovative um, sales channels from OEMs, NSCs, dealers and other non-franchise channels so um, I mentioned Cluno before and Drover examples of um, flexible used car bundled leasing it's marketed as subscription quite often um, and also, the clear there's been innovation in that space. Care by Volvo is quite an obvious example from the from the OEMs, um, where a bundled lease can be monthly or or can be a year. But the the point is the the the, the uh, terms are not a traditional three year or two year contract. Some of the more some of the business models have not really worked. Uh, you know, in ICDP we've modelled why that we you know they they wouldn't work. Um, Access by BMW has just closed their pilot on a, a number of pooled subscription schemes, which are clearly very difficult to make work with the economics. But we have one car priced for one customer, you know, whether it's a used or a new vehicle, uh, having that as a kind of bundled service priced appropriately compared, you know, uh, taking into account the period the customer is taking the car for is clearly something that's quite attractive, particularly in a time when. There's less economic certainty, less job security, and people's needs for travel are quite dynamic. And so a lot of these services have been evolving, allowing connectivity, for example, to allow OEMs to do quite different things. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> the keyless access, all sorts of things which allow for a more um, flexible service. And if you're running a service like that where customers may uh, rent the car for maybe a month or three months rather than, than, than a longer lease or purchase, um, that raises questions for delivery as well, and particularly in urban areas. You know, do you just deliver them in the traditional way with a, with a second car and picking up a driver, taking them back, or do you use flatbed trucks, you know, for, for urban delivery? And therefore we come back to the question about urban consolidation again, and how better to serve those, those areas. Um, a lot of OEMs are definitely looking at what at ICP we've called a build and operate model, where you start to look at the managed fleet more like uh, the fleet sector and servicing the retail sector and saying, okay, these cars are going to go through several cycles of use when they're new to a second user, third user, and we're going to own those vehicles. Uh, they get, the customers are going to be paying for the use of those and we will move them on, refurbish them, upgrade them, digital upgrades, physical upgrades as and when required. And that clearly requires a different type of logistics for the refurbishment. And, and some OEMs, I mean, Volvo in the UK have been experimenting with consolidating their PDI center, their new car compounds 
used car compounds and refurbishment processes as well for used vehicles. And I think there's lots of opportunities there for new types of service support, I think. Um, I wonder if you had a thought on, uh, a thought on that, um, Hev? Yes. Uh, in fact, we are moving uh, uh, to a functionality economy, as you say, with people wanting to have a service to have mobility as a service and not uh, and not necessarily own the car so uh, uh, if we go into into this and uh, as as you say it's the fault of many uh, audience if we go into this uh, this means that uh, uh, we will have to merge the logistics of new and used vehicles and uh, uh, that have uh, these are uh, these have been uh, in uh, in many uh, in many organisations, many OEMs and LSPs, so separate activities. But now, we, if we consider mobility as a service with a second, third user of the of the vehicles, then we will have to consider the global logistics, uh, new vehicles and used vehicles. Yeah, thank and, you. Right. Sorry, just, I'm just aware that we've got questions coming in. Um, John, do you have a thought on that before I? pick up the next question. Yeah, I think uh, building on what Hervé was saying, this indeed uh, is, is, is a, diff a different area. It's the area of, of used vehicles where uh, the key parameters are, 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 are different. Um, one important one, time, time is money, yeah, where the new vehicle process, of course, time is, is relevant, but more from an inventory and cash to cash cycle. But here, time is depreciation of the vehicle, certainly. Yeah. If you look to a used vehicle, in, in, in general terms, the average is 10 euro per, per car per day, depreciation, insurance costs, etc. So t time is money, and instead of bulky transports over a long distance to a, uh, to a compound, and then the last mile fine distribution, this is often a process of single pickups to a compound where things have to be done again back to the last mile to uh, to, to distribution. So these are different different processes, more intense. Uh, generally speaking, the IT systems of the, the the collective industry, OEMs and LSPs, I mean, are not designed uh, to fulfill those uh, processes. And yet these processes are growing fast. On the used car market in, um, in Europe, uh, leasing companies, ex-lease cars, are importing and exporting uh, on a European level and are desperately looking for efficient transport um, uh, models and, and costs. Yeah, single pickup is uh, relatively expensive. Um, and you see that also on the on the OEM side where uh, mobility services as the umbrella is, uh, is growing and growing. And what I see, I speak from experience, is that in the used car business, people are more and more looking for transport possibilities from Portugal to Denmark, because that's where you get the best price, so long long distance. And I see that uh, OEMs in general terms from IT systems, but also we didn't touch upon that yet, the other part is, is, is DNA, are not used to think in terms of uh, time, time is money in this, uh, in this process. So there's a lot of things um, from a digital perspective that need to be improved where investment is needed to facilitate uh, efficient business models in the new world. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, looking at the used car flows across Europe, they are substantial. And particularly on the nearly new zero kilometer side, it's huge flows, for example, out of Germany for nearly new pre-registered cars. And, and similarly, um, for example, coming out of Hungary into Western Europe, making use of exchange rates. So this, this, there's a lot of less organized flows, which could definitely do with more coordination, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, just pick up a comment from Mike Sturgeon. Handling of and access to data will be key. Look at the enormous amount of data that we generated on every vehicle with a proliferation of digital handovers. You know, what's the role of a photo booth, for example? And the, the, clearly, the, the, you know, since you've got images, that's a huge amount of data that needs to be processed, dis distributed. You know, the, again, the, the servers and the transaction of that data will require significant bandwidth, which in the past would have been a problem is less so now, but still, you know, it's a cost. It's a cost and it's an infrastructure requirement for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, just wanted to pick up the question from Ian Brown because we're getting close to the end. But um, he says, uh, this is an interesting session raising many key questions. On the topic of collaboration, I consider LSPs have been promoting this for efficiency reasons for some time with limited success. Does Herve in particular 
believe the OEMs are now ready to engage with this through some forum, which remains, of course, totally legal and does not risk anti-competition breaches? That's an interesting question. I, I will go to her first, clearly, for that question, and then, John, I'll come back to you. Um, I'm not sure I got uh, completely the, the, the question, but uh, if it's, uh, in, in fact, um, uh, if it's about um, getting... Um, I, th I think, uh, sorry, sorry, just to clarify, I think yes. I think Ian's asking, is there a forum, whether it's a, a IT platform or some other, or whether it's some other organisational structure which allows, which he says, you know, is totally legal, does not risk anti-competition anti breaches, which allows OEMs to engage in collaboration to generate efficiencies, I think is the yes, yes. question. Yes, yes. We, we, we already thought of that uh, in uh, our discussions uh, at uh, ECG. And there, there, are, there are indeed some, um, some issues about uh, the competition laws. Well, what we, uh, we uh, what could be done, in fact, is, uh, is um, to, uh, to create a special, uh, a special platform, as, uh, as he, he said, uh, that would uh, be sure to respect the competition laws to, to, uh, to, uh, to deal with this problem. But uh, the, the problem of uh, of empty uh, empty miles with uh, with trucks uh, 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 carrying um, um, uh, with uh, vehicle carrying trucks is uh, indeed a, a huge problem. I think we uh, uh, because uh, especially because uh, when you when you carry um, uh, general cargo, you can uh, more far more easily find uh, uh, find um, uh, uh, where's to, to transport from one place to another uh, without any uh, any uh, uh, big uh, loss in uh, in um, carrying uh, carrying empty uh, empty loads. But when you when you carry uh, uh, vehicles, since it's a highly specialized cargo, and uh, you can't do you can't do anything with your with your trailer, where if you don't have um, if you don't have uh, uh, vehicles to carry, uh, then the the problem of empty miles is more acute, and uh, the fact that we can't that we cannot uh, collaborate easily between uh, OEMs. Is uh, is uh, 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 hampering uh, this uh, optimization, especially now in terms of um, of uh, cost and uh, and uh, em environmental Im impact. Okay, uh, thanks, Sophie. Clearly, it's a very sensitive area when we start to talk about uh, how there's a form of collaboration <clears throat> uh, that also allows a competitive. Uh, tendering it and, and activity. But John, I wonder if you've got a thought on that as well. Yeah, in, in, in general uh, terms, uh, first, um, uh, collaboration is the, is the, is the, is the road towards, uh, let's say, reducing, reducing empty miles. It can be done within the boundaries of competition law, I can say from, uh, from experience. It has to be done, is my view, from the, from the boundaries from competition law. And I would say it's time given the challenges that we've discussed in the past hour, that um, on OEM and LSP level, we start to encounter on a strategic level rather than on the tactical, very operational level that for the past decades we've always been operating. Mm -hmm. Now referring to the inbound world, which is much more professional. There you talk with suppliers who co-design, co-develop uh, components for a vehicle. So if we follow the same anal uh, analogy, we should do the same in the outbound uh, finished vehicle, vehicle logistics would be my, my view. Yes, interesting. Thank you. Well, we're both were almost up to the clock, almost up to the hour. Um, uh, I'd like to say thank you to you both for 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 being uh, here today. It's been a very interesting discussion. We've got tons more we could discuss. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, and also thank you to questions and hello to Mike Sturgeon and Ian Brown. Thank you for your questions. Uh, any final thoughts, Herb or or John? I'll go, I'll go to you, Herb, first. Um, in terms of um, 
I would I would like to briefly to go back to the to the used cars uh, uh, issue. Uh, in terms of uh, environment, yes, we are, we are definitely going to uh, towards this type of uh, of society and of uh, uh, of behavior to to take more to take more advantage of what has already been built instead of um, instead of uh, uh, throwing up uh, uh, things when they uh, when they get uh, not not really used but simply obsolete so uh, um, i think that uh, the a better use of vehicles through uh, re remarketing uh, reusing uh, our our vehicles is uh, a good uh, good step towards the future and uh, it goes even beyond the finished vehicle logistics because uh, at uh, Renault we already think we are already thinking of uh, 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 a used vehicle factory that would uh, that would uh, uh, be fed by uh, by used vehicles and uh, that would produce uh, better uh, refurbished used vehicles or parts but uh, all this in a recycling uh, in a recycling uh, uh, point of view so it's part of the of our plans the uh, revolution plans and uh, it's very and uh, very uh, very enthusiastic that we we are going to in this direction for the for the future of the, the industry and the planet Fascinating. Thank you, Herb. I'm aware we're running over now, but John, any last comments? No, I'll keep it short, and uh, Ben, uh, building on what I just uh, just said, I think it's time it's time for a for a paradigm shift in the thinking between OEMs and and suppliers. We have to do things differently to capture the value that is there, capture value for everybody in the in the ecosystem. And and maybe the buzzword that relates to inbound is we should we should co-develop together rather than stay away too much so that's that's my view and that's as a closing message i'd like to give fantastic thank you thank you, thank you both for your well, time thank today. you all. Uh, thank you Herbie. thank you ben thank you john <clears throat> thank you everyone for watching <clears throat> i made it this this list of, of questions down but I, th I think people would criticize me for going over time far too long if i started to uh, go through them Really, really interesting session, thank you. Uh, I'm sure if, if we were uh, on one of those things, I think they used to be in-person events once upon a time when we had them. Uh, there would have been a lot of clapping in the audience for the session. One quick point, uh, if you wanted anyone sort of viewing and everyone viewing, tomorrow we've uh, uh, an outbound session on ports and terminals preparing for the future, which yes. is over the other side of the pond, will be worth the... Uh, really um, sort of uh, watching that episode. Uh, there's Rory Heckner from Mercedes-Benz USA, uh, Anu Gold from Volkswagen America, uh, Don Asdall, President and CEO of International Automotive Processing, John Felito uh, from Valenius, and Dennis Manns uh, will be uh, moderating it. So if you get a chance, tune into that. Uh, you can diarize it uh, through the platform anyway, but staying with your session. Thank you, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can look at a part part two in a couple of months or something. Sounds great. Thank, 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 thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. 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 Bye. Hi, it's Peter again, and thank you for watching the session. Don't forget you can connect with all members within the EV community send messages to each other, and start to build relationships for the future. Also, take a look at our supplier showrooms. Our partners have got lots of products and services that they have to offer, which again could be of benefit to you. Make the most of the opportunity, and thank you again for joining us. 